And they were going to talk about care. And we're going uh, to discover what God has to say about care. We're going to look at a very familiar story. I'm sure many of us here have heard the story of the Good Samaritan. How many of you have uh, at least heard this before? Natin yun na po ba to? I'm sure marami sa atin dito. And you know, uh, we're going to see that care is more than just about a strategy. Rather, this is actually something that God expects each and every one of His children how to treat others. Brothers and sisters, if you're here, I pray that as we open God's Word today, we're gonna be realigned to Him. Our hearts, our minds will be realigned back to God and we're gonna go back to what Christianity really is all about. And if you're here for the first time, we're so glad that you're here. I pray that through this, you will discover how greatly God loves you and how experiencing His love can change your life forever. Now, if there's one thing I want all of us here to remember from this preaching, here's the title of our message. Our topic is Care, Demonstrate God's Love. Could you please tap the person seated next to you, especially if you don't know him or her, and tell that person, Care, Demonstrate God's Love. Are you excited for our topic? Yeah. All right. Yeah. Now, before I tell the story, just a little background on what, does, what, what, what was happening here. One day, Jesus was with his disciples, and uh, he, the, uh, he sent 70 of them to actually minister ahead of him, and they were back. And they were actually sharing to Jesus what they, were, uh, what they, what, what they accomplished by God's grace. And, and they were really excited about it, and he was telling his disciples, you know what, you're so blessed to be hearing the things you're hearing. And then suddenly, there's this lawyer who stands up to put Jesus to the test. Now, a lawyer during their time was actually an expert of, in the law of Moses, the law that God gave uh, the Israelites through this person called Moses. And just like the lawyers today, if you ask them something about the law, almost automatically, they'll be able to answer you accurately. And so this guy really knew the law. And he asked Jesus, how can I have eternal life? How can I enter the kingdom of God? This question was really the top question in people's minds. If we survey po tayo sa Israel during that time, that would be their number one question. Because even though they offered sacrifices in the temple day after day after day, their sin still bothered their conscience inside. And so Jesus tells that uh, lawyer, what does the law say? And then this is what he replies. He answered, you shall love the Lord your God. Everyone say love. With all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And then in verse 28, the Bible says, Jesus said to him, you have answered correctly, do this and you will live or you will have eternal life. Now, how many of you, you honestly love God? Raise your hands. Okay, thank you so much for your participation. But how many of you, you know that yes, you love God, but there is no way you can love Him perfectly 24 hours a day, 7 days a week? There's no way, right? What was Jesus trying to do? It was like He was holding up a mirror in front of this guy. He was helping this guy see, hey, you need help. You can't do this. You can't enter in the kingdom of God by doing good works because you can never live a perfect life. That was what He was saying. You know, many people today, especially in our country, think that by doing good works, they can actually get to heaven. But if you read the Bible, it's so clear, like in this passage, that we will always fall short, and therefore we need a Savior. Now, by this time, he should have humbled himself before Jesus. Dapat sinabi na po niya, I really can't do this. I need help. But you know, in verse 29, this is... What happens? The Bible says, but wishing to justify himself, he says to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Now, for us to understand, in the Greek, the neighbor, neighbor, that word means someone who is near. Someone whom I associate with. Because to them, their neighbor was their fellow Jews. You see, they had a very classified system of people before. If you look at this diagram, those in the middle were the people they were to love the most. But as the people got farther from the middle, those were the people they were to hate the most. The Gentiles. They looked down on these people. Parang ganito po yan. Uh, I'm sure many of us here uh, watched General Luna, right? When I watched the movie, I remember what our history teacher 
teaches us that when we were invaded hundreds of years ago, the foreign invaders actually treated Filipinos as Indios. They treated them differently than how they treated their fellow countrymen. And that was exactly what was happening here. What he was expecting to hear perhaps from Jesus, you know what? Because Jesus knew his understanding of neighbor is due. He was expecting Jesus to say, you know what? Good job. You're already fulfilling the law. You're loving your neighbor as yourself. Are you still getting what I'm saying? He was expecting Jesus to say, you have fulfilled the law. Very good. But you know what? Instead of that, Jesus responds by telling him the parable of the good Samaritan. Did you get the background? That's the context. Let's go to our story. Verse 30, Jesus replies and tells him, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among rob- robbers. They stripped him and beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. Now, I'm sure meron po sa atin dito, na, nabugbog na tayo before, di ba? Uh, kung may katabi kayong ganun, uh, tawag na tayo ng ER. Uh, you know, uh, before I got discipled properly, when I was in high school many years ago, um, I was playing in this computer shop called Netopia in Alabang Town Center. How many of you remember this? In front of Puyat Sports. And I was playing this game called Counter-Strike. Now, for those of you who don't know Counter-Strike, para siyang war game na you hunt each other down. It's like a military war game. And in between the computer screens, there was a plywood so that the other player can't see where you are and you can actually surprise attack him. But... This particular time, I was in high school, there was a street kid play, uh, playing beside me. And what he did was he kept looking at my screen, gumaganon po siya. So he saw where I was. Comsat. <laughs> right. Uh, that's the term for that. Um, now, what I did was I slapped him in the head. <laughs> Binatukan ko po, and then I, I went back playing. Wala ko pakailam. Little did I know, to make the long story short, he called his friends and they hunted me down. They, uh, uh, naghabulan kami from the national bookstore, the old national bookstore, going down through the road. You know that sign in front of Alabang Town Center where there's a tower, nandun yung mga movie names? So nandun sila, mga 100 sila, mag-isa lang ako. <laughs> Dejo lang, mga lima po sila. And honestly, I, I'm not kidding, talagang they were punching me and gumaganon lang ako. Hindi ko alam kung ano nangyayari sa akin. Talagang gumaganon para lumayo lang sila. When the police came, they, they, they took the, the people uh, away from me, pero gumaganon pa rin ako. <laughs> When, when, nung pumunta po kami sa present, there was a hole in my pants and a hole in my shirt. It was a very traumatic experience. In fact, whenever I go to that place, I still remember what happened. You know, <laughs> what happened to me was no match for what happened to the man. If you look at the original Greek, that word beat means pummeled. It was like he was left half dead, 50-50. Just like the incidents we've heard in the news, some hazing victims. Just to paint a picture, perhaps this man, let's keep that picture up. Perhaps this man, perhaps his, his skin was violet, uh, swollen terribly, wounds uh, all over his body. In fact, um, this is a place that is really known in Israel today as the Path of Blood. This was a notorious place, just like how you would see Tondo at night, or Iraq, or Congo, Africa. Places where it's predictably dangerous. Very, very bad condition. Desperately in need of help. In a very lonely road where no one passes constantly. Have you ever been in that kind of situation? Very desperate situation. How devastating could it have felt? Now, good news. Jesus says there are... There, there's someone who will come. Now, in verse 31, Jesus said, By chance, a priest, everyone say priest, was going down on that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Now, on the surface, this, this really appears as a glimmer of hope. You see, a priest is like nowadays a pastor. He's like a Bible teacher, someone who is a high-ranking church official. This is someone who was supposed to be offering sacrifices in the temple. An example of virtue. I mean, it's like when, have you experienced that? When you watch a movie, and then the good guy gets pummeled, and then someone appears. It's like a breath of fresh air. We can eat popcorn again. It's like, yes, someone came in. We're sure he's going to do it. But you know what? He does the opposite. You know, this guy, because of his position, he knew the law. 
he should have known Leviticus chapter 9, verse 34 that says, if you have a stranger on your path, you meet the need of that stranger. That priest should also have known Exodus chapter 23, verse 4 to 5, which says, if your enemy has a donkey <laughs> and the donkey falls in a ditch, you have to rescue that donkey and bring him back to the person you consider your enemy. Now, more than this, this man would not have only known this, most likely in their culture, he would also have taught this to others. But what did he do? You know what the Bible said? This guy went the opposite direction. The Greek is very emphatic. If the man was here, the guy didn't go here. He went there. That's what it means in the original manuscript that he went the opposite direction. Very, very sad. Ironic. But there's a second person. In verse 32, the Bible says, Likewise, a Levite also, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. Now, a Levite is a temple minister. If we're going to equate it today, it's just like our worship leader. Or the worship leaders, just like the ushers who greeted, that, uh, greeted us outside. Or the ones who fixed the production, ministers in the temple. By virtue of their position, they would have also known in the head what the priest knew. They would have also uh, been examples, supposedly, of righteousness. But he does the very same thing. Now, the priest and the Levite. Both of these people knew the teachings of God. Both of them would have taught others the teachings of God. Yet what did they do? They ignored the man lying on the road. You know, uh, if you do your research... Some scholars say perhaps they didn't actually touch the body because in their culture, if you're a temple minister and you touch a dead body, it would render you unclean, kaya hindi ka na pwede mag-serve. But you know, in the passage, Jesus said He was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. The temple was in Jerusalem. The passage actually reveals their hypocrisy. They just worshipped in the temple, served God in the temple, and then they go out of church. And they see someone in need. Knowing what they needed to do, they didn't do it. What does this mean? These two people represent those who play church on Sundays, go to youth services on Saturdays, attend Bible studies on Wednesdays, but there is no change in their lives. These two represent people who play lifeless religion. They study the Bible, and there's nothing wrong with that. They teach the Bible, and there's nothing wrong with that. But the change is not seen in their lives. You know, um, I submit to each and every one of us, Jesus did not die on the cross for us to be mere intellectuals. Jesus did not die on the cross just so that we could fill our heads with information and judge those who know less than us. Jesus did not die on the cross for us to merely have events and programs or for us to merely go on a service every Sunday. Jesus died on the cross for something much more than that. My question to each and every one of you is this. Are we just like the Levite or the priest? If you ask yourself this question, what would be your answer? Are we just like the priest or the Levite? Jesus then tells of a third person that comes by, a Samaritan. Now for us to understand the gravity of this statement, we need to understand who the Samaritans really were. The Samaritans were also Jews, just like us. We're mostly Filipinos here. Some of us live in Alabang. Some of us live in Baguio. Some of us live in Cebu. But we're all Filipinos. 
Samaria, where they lived, was really a capital city. But when the Assyrians came and destroyed the city because of God's judgment for their idolatry, when the city was destroyed, the Assyrians started bringing foreigners in to Samaria. Along with the foreigners came their rituals, their idolatrous practices, their rituals of feeding babies to the fire. And now, instead of the Jews staying faithful to God, they actually intermarried with these Gentiles, and they now took upon themselves their own culture. And from that time on, the Jews said, you know what? You betrayed us. You betrayed our nation, and most of all, you betrayed God. And from now on, we don't want to have anything to do with you. In fact, the Jews didn't even want the dust of Samaria to touch their feet. Could you imagine that? Nag-invite kayo sa bahay nyo? Pagdating ng bisita, sabi niya, I don't want to touch the alikabok in your house. <laughs> That's how terrible the discrimination was. It's, it was just like, the discrimination between blacks and whites and browns and whites, the apartheid, terrible racism and unjust treatment. Perhaps some of you here have experienced that kind of treatment in the past. How would you have felt? In verse 33, our Lord says, a Samaritan who was on a journey came upon him. And when he saw him, felt compassion, and came to him, and bandaged up his wounds, pouring oil and wine on them, and he put him on his own beast, and brought him to an inn, and took care of him. On the next day, he took out two denarii, and gave them to the innkeeper, and said, take care of him. And whatever more you spend, when I return, I will repay you. You know, in the contrast to the first two people, I'm sure you've all seen this. The Samaritan had compassion, stopped to help, and cared for the man. He demonstrated sacrificial care. Remember, this passage is, about, is, is talking about how to enter heaven. And what Jesus was trying to do was he was trying to help the lawyer understand if you think you can get to heaven by loving your neighbor, you will always fall short because there is no way you can fulfill this perfectly. It's impossible for you because this is a supernatural kind of love, amen? This is a, an unusual kind of love. Now, how then does this relate to us? Yes, to love like this is impossible for us in and of ourselves. But here's the thing, brothers and sisters. To love like how the Samaritan did is made possible for those who have a personal relationship with God. Remember that verse I shared with you, 1 John 4, 19? It says, we love because He first loved us. You know, remember the, the lawyer answered Jesus when Jesus said, what does the law say? The lawyer said, love the Lord your God with all that you are and love your neighbor as yourself. Remember, this is exactly the same word. Remember, this is uh, addressed to believers, those who have been a recipient of the gospel. It's co we are commanded to love according to how God expects us to love in the law. Are you still with me? This is possible for us. You know, uh, when I was in college, I had so many teachers who had different religious perspectives. I had teachers who were Hinduists, Buddhists, Taoists, kung siguro med student ako, pati dentists. Uh, kung ano -anong teaching. And as I went through life, I met people, you read blogs online, there's so many different teachings about so-called truths. But you know what separates Christianity from all the rest of these so-called truths? It's this radical love. That's why if people can't see that love in us, it doesn't really matter how much we know. It doesn't really matter how much doctrine we know. If we have an, a, a PhD, an, uh, a masterals, a DMD, DVD, VCD, uh, it doesn't really matter. They need to see this in our lives. You know what the early church the defining trait of the early church was not primarily what they taught. 
Because there were so many teachings in the pagan world. What was strikingly different was the way they loved one another. Was the way they treated those who took their possessions, those who killed their family members. And that's how the church grew before because that love was strongly manifested and they saw the, the validation of their faith. That has to be the same for us. Amen? That has to be the same for us. The reason why Christianity is losing its power today is not because we know less. It's because we love less. Now, let me just share with you three things very, very quickly. Three things that we can see in what the Samaritan did. What does it mean? What are the things that we uh, must see if someone is loving as Jesus expects us to love? First, we see compassion. Everyone say compassion. Verse 33, Jesus said, when he saw him, the Samaritan felt compassion. Now, how many of you have experienced um, receiving a call, a, a tragedy happened, emergency happened? I'm sure many of us, right? One morning, I was preparing for the preaching in um, our youth services two months ago, I think, and this girl named Kylie calls me. She was crying. Kylie is the second from uh, your right. She was crying and she said, you know, Kuya Dan, I need your help. Si mommy, nahimatay. Apparently, they were just have, uh, having breakfast. And then when her mom stood up, she fainted. And bumubula daw yung bibig. And she was rushed to the hospital. And so, I just asked God, what should I say? Because you, you, these are, th this is something serious. So, I just prayed for her and I did what, what little I could. So, to gather help for her mom to be admitted. The next day, I went to the uh, hospital in Cavite. And as I went to the ICU uh, area, I found her, Tita Aloha's husband. Tita Aloha, by the way, let's show that picture, is the woman in the middle. Her husband, Tito Ted, was there, and he was narrating to me what happened. And as he was sharing with me what happened, the ordeal they went through the past day, you know what? I was trying to imagine, what if that happened to me? What if that happened to my mom? What if that happened to a loved one? And you know what? By God's grace, as I was trying to imagine this, I was feeling the pain. I was feeling the stress. I was sharing the grief. And I even had to say, wait lang po, I need to sit down because I was feeling the burden inside of my heart. That's what it means to have compassion. Because compassion, the word passion means suffer and co means with. It's to suffer with someone. That's what it means to feel compassion. You see, in Matthew chapter 9, it's not here on screen, the Bible says, Jesus went through all the towns and villages and he was preaching and, and healing the sick and ministering to the people. And the Bible says when he saw the crowds, he saw compassion. He saw them for their real state. You know what, brothers and sisters, whenever we're around our, our employees, our colleagues, we need to see them as Jesus sees them. We need to see people for how they really are. We need to realize how, what state they are in right now without God. How many of you here, you don't need to raise your hands again, even though you're a Christian, when you have problems, you still struggle inside of you. Marami po sa atin, when we have trials, sometimes we're even tempted to doubt God, right? We're tempted to ask questions. Tama yun. <laughs> sometimes we're, we're struggling inside of us, right? Now, let me ask you this question. How do you think would it feel these people around us, they don't have the Holy Spirit. They don't know the promises of God. They don't have a relationship with God. That's why they deal with their problems by drinking, partying, uh, illicit relationships because they're broken and empty inside. And we need to realize these people are the way they are and we need to do something about it. Amen. Amen. We need to see them as Christ sees them. And you know what? Just like a person who's in love, if the Lord sees them with compassion, dapat tayo po, if in love tayo kay Lord, when we see other people, we also see them with compassion. When the man saw, when the Samaritan saw the man, he did not feel disgust. He did not feel condemnation or even apathy at walang pakialam. He saw it with compassion. In other words, if we're gonna love as Christ wants us to love, we need to see people with compassion. Amen. Next, there was also care. 
in verse 33, the Bible says, He felt compassion and came to him and bandaged up his wounds, pouring oil and wine on them, and he put him on his own beast and brought him to an inn and took care of him. Now, have you ever rushed someone to the emergency room before? Uh, you know, I remember uh, when my grandfather was still alive, I rushed him to the emergency room when, uh, I'm sorry, my grandmother, when my grandfather was alive, we rushed my lola to the emergency room. And uh, I'm sure some of us here have experienced rushing someone to a good emergency room, and they really take care of you, right? But you know what? In that case, there was no emergency room. The Samaritan was the emergency staff. You know, scholars tell us, if the man was on a journey, he must have had clothes. So can you imagine this with me? For example, you're journeying through the province, and on, along the way, you will see a man robbed, beaten, 50-50. That means you will get out of the car, and you will get your extra clothes and actually bandage his wounds, create tourniquets so that, to stop the bleeding. Or if he didn't have clothes, he would have tore from his robe so that he could create those clothes, those first aid. Uh, now, oil and uh, wine were supposed to soothe and sanitize. In fact, I discovered, did you know that the principle of alcohol, yung pinararabo sa kamay, it was from the parable of the Good Samaritan. And then after that, he actually put him on his own beast that entailed him to walk slowly on a road that was dangerous. He opened himself up to danger. My whole point is that he demonstrated care. I'm sure many of us here have experienced taking care of someone in the hospital overnight, especially mga nanay, di ba? Can you imagine doing that for a stranger? Can you imagine doing that for someone who discriminates you? who says things against you, who looks down on you, and who can give you something in return. That was what the Samaritan did. In fact, in 1 John 3.18, John tells the believers once again, Little children, let us not love with word or with tongue. Or wag lang puro salita, but in deed and truth. This is a supernatural kind of love. Let me share with you, for example, the story of this guy named Harley. Now, Harley... His mom died when he was 12. Two years after his father died. At 14. And you know, he ended up being an atheist and an, an agnostic. He was questioning God, Lord, why did this happen to our family? Sa lahat ng pwedeng pangyarihan ito, bakit pamilya pa namin? And then when, when, he was, uh, when he was taken care of by a relative, he fled home and went to the home of his aunt here in Las Piñas. Now, his aunt was a Christian. His aunt used to go to a church in Manila. But, and, and of course, thank God, this, this aunt tried to invite him in Manila, but he could not because he was studying here in Las Piñas, in BFCAM. Now, what his aunt did was, she decided to leave her church there and find a church here so that she can invite Harley with her. And then she found CCF Alabang. Now, what she did was she covered all his costs. She took care of him, went out of her way, paid for, her, for his commuting expenses, his food. And you know what happened? He attended the Vesper service here. And he heard about the singles sports event. Now, when he went to that event, he met someone who actually went to the youth service also. And this person demonstrated care once again went out of uh, his way and said, you know what, I'm going to accompany you to the youth service because you're still a student. You know what happened to Harley? He heard the gospel. He experienced the forgiveness of his sin and he got discipled. You know what Harley is doing now? From an atheist and an agnostic, he is now our worship leader, one of our worship leaders, and he's now about to lead his own small group. How many of you know the power of God is real? Because someone demonstrated care. Can you imagine if you have office mates, they, they share with you, you know what, our marriage is having problems. We need help. Maghihiwalay na kami ng asawa ko. And you know there's a CCF retreat, couples retreat for them. Or there's a Bible study, a small group that will help them for couples. But they can't because their baby needs someone to watch over him. Can you imagine you? Because you're consumed with the love of God, 
you volunteer and say, you know what, I'm gonna take care of your baby for two days or for an overnight. Just go to that couple street because it will, it's gonna help you. How many of you know that it's gonna impact that friend? Or for example, uh, a person doesn't have money, doesn't have food. A, an office mate, suddenly a crisis hit them and you go out of your way, oh, sige, I brought extra food for you. You know what, I'm gonna help you uh, move into your new house. Can you imagine the impact it will create? You know what? Because this is a supernatural kind of love. Weird po to sa mundo eh. And they will see there's something real with that person, with what that person is saying. My point is, if we want to love as Jesus, we need to demonstrate tangible care. We need to see people with compassion. We need to demonstrate tangible care. And we need to remember there's a cost. There's a cost. In verse 35, Jesus says, On the next day, he took out two denarii, and gave them to the innkeeper and said, take care of him, and whatever more you spend, when I return, I will repay you. Now, I'm sure meron po dito mga allergic sa spending, no? Yung mga tipong pagka-sale, sale lahat, tas kasama niyo yung pamilya niyo, parang nangingin, <laughs> parang gastos na naman. Um, but you know, you need to realize, you and I need to realize that if we're gonna love as Jesus did, there will always be a cost. Amen. Uh, this doesn't mean that you will just give and give without giving any thought. Can you ask each and every one of us a question? Who owns the money that is in our bank accounts? Who? Si God po. And so whenever a person comes to us and asks for help, the first thing we need to do is not look at our emotions. It's to pray and ask God for wisdom and discernment and just do as He leads us to do. Now, just to give you an idea of what was happening here, the, re- the, the innkeepers here were not really good people. Just this year, I had the privilege to attend a conference in Stuttgart, Germany, a conference with youth pastors from around the world because CCF were part of um, an alliance all over the world in making disciples. So uh, after the conference, I had an extra day. So I said, uh, I don't go here naman every day, so I want to tour around the city. So when I went back to the hotel, I, I transferred hotels and and um, not everyone in Germany speaks English. But thankfully, these receptionists actually know English. So, medyo cute nga po how they talk. Uh, sabi ko, uh, can I leave my things here? Sure, no problem. Gawa ganun. So, uh, mabait naman sila. Very, <laughs> very hospitable people. So, uh, you know, I, I went around the city. And when I got, got back, my things were there. Uh, in one piece, uh, didn't lose anything. Very, very nice experience. But you know what? The innkeeper during their time and in their culture was nowhere near that receptionist. The innkeepers there were extortionists. They would get as much money as they can from you. You know, to denarii, how much that costs? A denarii, a denarius, I'm sorry, is worth one day's wage. So he gave this person two days wage and he said he did not give a ceiling. He did not say, oh, pagdating ng 2,000 pesos, Palabasin mo na yan. <laughs> he did not say up to this. No, he said, you know what? Whatever needs spending, I will pay with it. I will pay for it when I return. How many of you know this is weird? How many of you know this is unusual? This is ridiculous. You're right. This is ridiculous in the eyes of the world. This is what should set each and every one of us apart from everyone else in this world. This is the only way your neighbors will believe what you're saying. This is the only way your children will believe what you're saying. This is the only way your colleagues, your employees, and your supervisors will believe what you are preaching to them if they see this ridiculous kind of love in your life. Let me share with you the story uh, of this guy. But we, uh, first, this girl in the picture that they will show now. Her name is Sheila. Sheila uh, is one of our leaders in Elevate, and she's helping out with our youth services. Now, when she came to know Christ, God gave her a burden for her classmates. So that burden actually manifested. More than words, she started inviting a lot of her classmates. But she had this one org mate called Prince Turtogo. Now, Prince is the kind of guy Na walang pakialam sa mundo. <laughs> this is the kind of guy who just played Dota all day. 
Okay? May nakaka-relate po dito. Uh, this is the kind of guy who doesn't care about studies. Who just cares about having fun. Now, Sheila spent two months inviting Prince. But, he, but she would hear the very familiar phrase each and every one of us almost here have heard. Try ko. <laughs> if not, ayoko. And so, try palagi, but Prince would not come. But Sheila, one day, decided to just pick Prince up from school. Apparently, they had a school activity perhaps, and she said, from school, I'm gonna take you to the youth service. But Prince reasoned he wasn't dressed for a youth service, so he needed to go home. But Sheila knew this was just an alibi. Perhaps when he goes home, he would just change and go to sleep or play Dota again. So she said, I wanna think they had someone else with them. I'm gonna... I'm going to uh, accompany you home and then I'm going to accompany you to, the, to the, you to the youth service. You know what? Sheila paid for Prince's uh, jeepney fare, even for his food. You know what happened to Prince? When Prince went here, he heard the gospel. He realized that God loves him. You see, this guy's life is a very dysfunctional uh, background. His dad is disabled because of a sickness, and his mom can't work to take care of his dad. His sister is the only one providing for their needs. And so, very messy life for this young man. But you know, Prince got discipled. He started attending regularly. Someone took the time for, to disciple Prince. You know what Prince is doing now? After just a year, he is now a D12 leader, reaching out to tens of students. By the way, for those of you who don't know, a D12 leader is a D group leader who leads other D group leaders. That's what happened to this young man's life because people gave freely to Prince. There's a cause, and we must give freely. Now, what have we learned? Three things we can see in what the Samaritan did. If we're gonna love the way Jesus loves, the way Jesus wants us to love, we need to see people with compassion. Not see them with apathy. Not just pass by them. Not just give a small donation and do nothing. But to see them with compassion. See them for how they really are. Also, we must care and demonstrate tangible acts of kindness. And we must realize there is a cost, and it's a privilege for us to give freely. You see, when we don't care, hindi naman nawawalan si God eh. Tayo yung nawawalan because we miss out on the privilege that God can use us to actually be an instrument to bless the people around us. Care demonstrate God's love. Let me just end with this story. This girl in the picture is Angel Monteclaro. Now, Angel is a girl who, who goes here regularly with her, families on, with her family on Sundays. I, you know, I, I keep giving examples of young people because, you know, I just with them all the time. And, and it's really a great joy for me to witness what God is doing in their lives. Now, Angel, let's show her picture, um, came to know God. And, and God, just like what he did in the, the, the heart of uh, Harley's Tita, and the heart of Sheila, she had a burden for her campus. So, Angel actually invited her friends. Now, she had a best friend named Linz Madelo, the one on your right. Linz is the typical girl who is looking for love. May mga kilala po ba yung ganun dito? <laughs> Ayan, yung mga naghahanap ng pagmamahal. So, Linz, at her young age in high school, was, was really looking for it from relationships. And then, she was trying to fill the emptiness in her life by going to parties. Party lang ng party. May mga parents nakaka-relate dito, yung mga anak na palagi may lakad. Now, what Angel did was this. For her birthday, sabi niya, guys, birthday gift niyo sa akin, I want you all to go. She forced her whole barkada to go. And Linz was there. You know what? Linz came only because of the free food. Because Angel told her, you know what, punta ka sa youth service, nililibre ko kayo ng pagkain. And you know what, Angel also brought Linz home after 
the service. You know what happened to Linz? Linz, when she came here, heard about the love of Jesus. She heard that only Jesus can actually fill the void in her heart. That in spite of all that she did, there was still someone who loved her like crazy. Someone who wanted her to have a relationship with him. Someone who saw her with value. Someone who saw her with importance. You know, Linz, by God's grace, gave her life to Jesus. And then someone went out of her way to disciple Linz. Taught her how to read the Bible. Taught her how to share the gospel. Taught her how to deal with trials. Taught her the value of attending worship services every week. You know what happened to Linz? That burden was imparted in her heart. You know, when she was in high school, uh, just two years ago, she was unstoppable. She would stand at the table in her canteen, in their canteen, and she would hold the poster and promote our youth services. She would go from room to room. Sasabihan niya yung mga, yung mga batchmates niya, umaten kayo sa Saturday, masaya dito. And every walk for her was a prayer walk. She would, uh, because this, was our, this is our training for our student leaders, whenever she would go to the CR, she would go to the library, everywhere she went, she would discreetly lay her hand on the classroom she would pass by and ask God to touch the hearts of the students she passes by. You know what? God used Linz and her small group of friends in just four months from just one student, just eight students after that, 120 plus of her classmates heard the gospel after just four months. Amazing. Amazing what God did. And right now, she's a detailed leader as well. Amazing the power of God. If only the church, if only you and me would stop just being once a week Christians. If we would just stop trying to pretend like everything is okay. If we would just stop closing our eyes to the reality that people who don't have God are dying in their sins right now. Amazing what this nation would look like if we will just love like Jesus wanted us to love. Brothers and sisters, let us, just, let us stop just trying to educate or inculcate, but by the grace of God, because of who He is, because of what He has done for us, let us demonstrate. Care, demonstrate God's love. Could you please turn to the person beside you for one last time and say, care, demonstrate God's love. Did you learn something this afternoon? Yes. Praise God. Let's all bow our heads and close our eyes. Lord, thank you so much for your word. Thank you so much that it pierces our hearts and shows us where we ought to be, where our hearts ought to be, how our lives ought to look. Lord, I just pray that we would be the church that you desire us to be. That we will never be accused. That we just know things in the head. But the people around us just can't see it in our lives. May we never be accused by our children that we are hypocrites. May we never be accused by our colleagues. The faith we profess is just a big joke. But I just pray that day after day, Lord, we will be consumed with your love. We will be reminded of the gospel and that it will overflow to the people around us. As all eyes are closed and as all heads are bowed down, I just want to pray for a group of people. You see, you cannot give what you don't have. And the reason why we love others is not so that we can please another human being. It's not primarily because we're guilty or we're afraid of the consequence, but it's because of the love of God. You know, the Bible says, the truth is that no matter how your circumstances look like, no matter what people have done to you in the past, the truth never changed that God loves you. That He looks at you with love 
And the truth is that we're, we, we're, we're trapped. We have a problem. Because we're sinners and God is holy, we were separated from Him. That's why we have a broken and empty life without God in this world. And sometimes we try to search for meaning and purpose and identity and love and security that only God can give because we don't have that relationship. And the Bible is very clear that no matter how religious we try to be, no matter if we attend church every day, it doesn't, it wouldn't really mend that relationship. But the good news is that 2,000 years ago, Jesus died on the cross. God came into our world and He carried those sins that separated us from Him. And He dealt that on the cross. And He promises that no matter what you've done, no matter what you've done in the past, no matter how dirty you think you are, if you will put your faith in Him, you will experience His forgiveness. And so if there's anyone here, only between you and God, you're willing to humble yourself and say, Lord, you know the truth is I'm a sinner and I need your forgiveness. Lord, I need, I need you to save me from my sins. If that's you, I want you to pray this prayer with me. If you want to put your faith in Jesus, if you don't know what to say, I can lead you in this prayer, but you need to make this a prayer of your heart. Say, Lord Jesus, thank you for loving me. Thank you for dying on the cross to save me from my sins. Lord, please forgive me for everything that I have done against you. Because of who you are, you are God. I surrender my life to you. From now on, Lord, be the master of my life. And I believe, Lord, that you only, Lord Jesus, can save me from my sins. Thank you for this promise of forgiveness. Thank you for this promise of our relationship with you. Change my heart. Allow me, Lord, to be a channel of your love to the people around me. And Lord, I just pray that every single day I will grow deeper and deeper in my knowledge and intimacy with you. Thank you so much, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. And everyone said, Amen and Amen. Praise God. Praise God. God bless you all.